Well, good afternoon. Uh, Matt said that I should introduce myself, so I will. I'm Ed Crowther, and uh, the chair of the Department of History, Government, Philosophy, the chair of Teacher Education, and I sometimes get to pretend to be a historian. And I would like to acknowledge my dear friend and colleague, so I'll get to introduce you, uh, Dr. Matt Nearing, who is responsible for the pizza and for the room, which are two very good and important things today. Thank you, Matthew. And it's also my, my privilege to get, once again, to be a part of uh, what's become a special evolving tradition at Adams State University. And it's really the, the brainchild of two important elements at Adams State University. Students and our president, David Svaldi, who um, as I recall, against uh, rather stern words from me, said, uh, we're going to have this King Week and we're going to cancel classes and all this stuff. And um, maybe um, you turned out to be right and once again I turned out to be wrong. But now the uh, Black Student Union, the Grizzly Activity Board, uh, as well as uh, the Department of History, Government, Philosophy and Teacher Education and other entities on campus, I uh, have been putting on a welter of activities, and so I should introduce Megan, the, the president of, of the Black Student Union, who has done a tremendous job uh, in promoting in a part of the world that we don't necessarily associate with African American culture, uh, the, the history culture of African Americans, but also as a, as a larger initiative to make Adams State University a welcoming place for all kinds of students because fundamentally and under President Savaldi's leadership that's been what Adams State University has been about to make it a place for all kinds of students to achieve and, and find a sense of a learning community, find a sense of a social community here at Adams State. With that, we should move to, to really what I'm here for, which is to talk a little bit about Dr. King and the theme today, Dr. King and the American Dream. Uh, it's been both a delight and really a challenge as a historian to talk about, about Dr. King. I think anybody working with Dr. King is, is humbled both by the subject matter and then now having published some about Dr. King, you, know, you feel a very uh, powerful sense of your own inadequacy when you take your interpretations of King's career and his uh, prolific writings and you compare your work to the, the outstanding exemplary scholarship of, of other people. And with that, there's also the responsibility at a place like Adams State University when they let you in some sense uh, be the torchbearer for the legacy of Dr. King, maybe from a historical perspective, uh, because that other people are doing other things, and so this is what you do. Because getting Martin Luther King right is important. Understanding who this man was, both as a person and then who he has become as a symbol, is an important task, and it is contested to reign. Uh, both the Republican and Democratic parties in the recent election claimed the mantle of Martin Luther King. And that's an amazing thing that only, in a, it says more about our politics than perhaps it says about anything else. Even this statue, how many of you recognize the statue? How many of you visited? Now, my poor spouse, Lori, who's here in the audience, has been dragged. It can be a freezing day, and if we're in Washington, I say, we got to go. It's time to go visit Martin. And this is a beautiful statue, and it actually is the sort of genesis for the, 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 the title of, of the talk. And so uh, you, can, you can see that... Um, this worked until just now. You can see that uh, here that, um, <clears throat> oh, I know why. It's because of this. Um, you can see that Dr. King himself in his most famous uh, address, the, uh, what you call the I Have a Dream speech, 
uh, as he began to wind down to his crescendo, he says, you know, this is what the movement is all about, that out of this, this mountain of despair of racism and segregation and materialism and oppression, right, we can create a stone of hope. And of course, this is the, the, the motif in the, the, the memorial that uh, Martin, in effect, was that stone of hope hewed out of this giant mountain of despair. My poor students, as I've moved more from the American Civil War into the area of civil rights, hear these, these diatribes on how bad things were in the 30s, 40s, and 50s for African Americans. But as Martin would say, how bad it was for all people who chose to be locked in this horrible system of apartheid. It was bad for the people who were the victims of apartheid, but it did nothing good for the people who were the oppressors. It was life destroying for African Americans, but it was soul destroying for uh, the United States and for its white majority population. One of the things, and I'll pick on Lori again, that she has had to endure is that when we visit, and we're lucky enough because of our, our vocational responsibilities to go to D.C. and to go to this memorial, and so when I go to the memorial, you know, uh, I read the words of Dr. King that if you look at the memorial, it's rimmed in a, a gray granite, and on this, on this granite are these, uh, the words of Dr. King, and one of the um, phrases, this is from Dr. King's acceptance speech of the Nobel Prize in 1964. They're beautifully chosen words. And so look at what Dr. Maybe why we remember Dr. King is the power uh, and in some ways optimism of his philosophy. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. That is not how I teach history, right? Dr. King is more optimistic than I am. But then listen to this, temporarily, uh, temporarily defeated, right? This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. And for a man who came of age in the, uh, when, when Adolf Hitler was in power in the Third Reich and who witnessed the horrors of Stalinist Russia at a time when evil appeared to be, if not triumphant, at least in session, for Dr. King to have this belief, it's an amazing exercise in optimism. And the thing that fascinates me as a scholar, I don't understand. I know it is a fact, but I do not understand the fact why Dr. King would not abandon the ideas and founding principles of the United States of America that for the most part in his entire life were honored in the breach, especially where African Americans were concerned. And yet to his last days, it seemed as if he could find something to believe in in what he called the American dream. And so it's interesting that in his most famous speech, the I Have a Dream speech, as he begins the long crescendo, I have a dream, he says, you know, I still have a dream. And these to me are very powerful words. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. Many African Americans of King's generation had abandoned the notion of liberal constitutionalism and, 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 and integration and had embraced the separatist philosophies associated with black power. Others flirted with, uh, uh, with migration back to Africa. Others flirted with sec uh, uh, secular philosophies associated with Marxism. And yet it was the minister, the Baptist preacher, Dr. King, who was in a position to know so much how white United Statesians had dishonored this American dream, for him to hang on to it is to me a remarkable thing that truly I simply don't understand. And so 
I thought today, since Dr. King's most famous speech makes reference to the American dream, maybe we should look at what Martin meant by that term and maybe find some understanding therein. Because one of the things Dr. King was very good at was explaining himself. And it just so happened months before Dr. King went to Washington as part of the People's Crusade for Jobs and Justice in the summer of 1964 that he gave an address at Drew University. Drew University was the academic home of a man named George Kelsey, Dr. George Kelsey. He had a PhD from Yale. And in my own uh, explorations in King's life, he is the reason that King said that he became a minister. He was a sociologist. And it was Kelsey who convinced King that you could be a scholar, and that you could hold to the traditions of African-American Christianity all at the same time. And Kelsey went on to get a PhD at, at Yale and he moved from Morehouse College where he was Dr. King's professor to Drew University where he taught for 20 years. And so it was as Dr. Kelsey's guest that King came to Drew University, a Methodist school in Madison, New Jersey, and gave this speech that's called the American Dream. It's what he called it. And so, not unlike a theme that he developed in his very famous I Have a Dream speech, Martin Luther King located the quintessence, the acme, the core of the American Dream, and the powerful words of paragraph two of Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths as self-evident, meaning that there is no need to subject them to truth, uh, to, a, to, a, to a proof. They're simply self-evident. We know that they're true, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then he says, and I think this is a powerful line, this is a dream. Now there's a mark of terminal punctuation there, but you can imagine King delivering this address and sort of inviting you into his narrative is it a dream obtainable? Is it a dream that has been realized? Is it a dream for some future time? And so with that sort of introduction, right, Dr. King says, this is the notion of the American dream. Now I wanted to bring this speech to you and then I realized President Savaldi would chasten me for bankrupting the, the college printing budget. Um, but he goes on and he says, here's some things that I like about the American dream and that is at its nub, it's not confined to United Statesians. He would say, it's not a dream just for white Americans or just for Protestants or just for Catholics or just for Jews or just for blacks or just for whites. And you have to remember that Dr. King, while he has a PhD from Boston University in philosophy, he is a minister whose religious understanding um, presupposes a supernatural deity, right? And so you can read about Martin Luther King's Christ, uh, uh, kitchen conversion and, and, and see the words that he uses. And so for him, this is a powerful idea. These dreams are not rooted in the laws of nature. They are spoken into existence by nature's God. And in that sense, they're inalienable because ultimate reality can never be taken away. And so it's a very powerful idea rooted in King's theology that informs him here. Now, one of the things that I find powerful about the writings of people like Abraham Lincoln and the people like Martin Luther King is that they are prophetic writings. That is, they are writings that attempt to tell the critical truth, right? And then of course with King, he's always fond of citing, particularly the Old Testament prophets. And for those of you that did not grow up going to Sunday school, 
which obviously did wonders for me, the Old Testament prophets were critics of the lack of justice, the lack of equity, the lack of righteousness in Israel. So it's a powerful text that he touches on. And so here he says, here's the deal. There is the American dream. But at least historically, it has not been realized. And it's not been realized by, because of what historians call the original sin of the United States. Slavery and racism. Right? And if you've seen the new Lincoln film, you understand what it took to get rid of the institution of slavery. And if you've taken my classes, you know that then my people simply found a way to create slavery by another name. And then it took Dr. King and others, the people that Dr. Payne will talk about tomorrow, to try to tackle the problems of racism and segregation. And so the great paradox, the land founded on the universal principle that all people are created equal, systematically, structurally, legally, uh, through the various socializing forces, creates a norm where some people are far more equal than others. But Dr. King would not be Dr. King if all he did was say, you people are bad. It is wrong for a minister to simply point out that you are sinners and you are facing damnation. It is up to that minister to prescribe a solution. And he does this in this speech. Now one of the things he says, you have to understand, he tells his audience, that getting this dream right really matters. In a time when the United States was competing for the uh, favor of the third world countries as they were moving out of colonization, it was hard for many of these countries whose populations were predominantly people of color to think that the United States was an attractive ally vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union when the United States turned fire hoses on little children marching down the street in Birmingham. And so he says, you know, you need to get this right. Because if you don't get this right, the United States will destroy itself. But then he goes on, and the passage was just too long. He says, in that same passage, he says, but even if it wasn't about your self-interest, getting this thing right is important because it is simply evil to persist in racism. And so it's practically expedient it's morally right and healing and cleansing to get rid of this original sin. And so he says, what do you do? If you realize you must do something, what must you do? And this is when Martin just gets righteous. First, you have to think about the world as your community and not the narrow self-interest of your military industrial complex. This is pretty powerful stuff. Right? In the Cold War like today, our tax dollars support the projection of U.S. hard power rather than the technical and creative assistance of the American people for global betterment. And there is a huge distinction between giving people a hand up and shooting them down. If Dr. Backen was here, perhaps he could explain how maybe there's, uh, it's a little fuzzier. But I'll just say that I grew up in the South, and so I don't see things in such a nuanced way. Another thing that you could do, he says, eliminate racism. You know, it's funny. Even today, if we were teaching a class on the psychology and sociology of racism, we could simply... Quote Dr. King, right, whose undergraduate degree, by the way, is sociology. We could quote Dr. King and say, well, boy, here's some interesting reasons why racism persists. We say they are simply not as good, as clean, as moral, as smart as we. Now, we never test that proposition 
We simply back it up with the power of the state and the ability of our institutions, like education, to exclude some people for participation while automatically including others. We've gotten over this, right? Yeah, right? And I mean, i got to tell you, my first book is about how we used biblical text and religious denominations to justify shadow slavery in the United States, right? And then we use that same prescription to justify Jim Crow. And today, we use that same prescription against gays and lesbians and transgendered people Forgetting the fact that apparently God was the God of all people, right? I guess we miss that. And this is one that's just amazing. So we'll do this exercise that I do in my classes. Let's see if you can answer this question correctly. And think about the idea of how segregation can have results that are permanent and crippling and they are not the fault of the victim or the victim group they are the misdeed of the oppressive group think of the answer to this question you're a young african-american male you're 20 years old and you're in jackson mississippi in an open space on Highway 51, State Street in Jackson, and a white voice like mine wearing a badge says, Boy, you got any money? What's the right answer? There are only two possibilities, right? What would the two possibilities be? Yes or no? So which one's right? Want to take a shot? Which one's right? Yes, so you don't get busted for vagrants. Right, but then you're a thief. So you answer yes, and I put you in jail for theft. And if you answer no, I put you in jail for vagrancy. And then I charge you court cost, I charge you rent in the jail, and then you can't ever get out until I turn you over to a white person who will pay your court expenses and then allow you to work to pay them off. But of course, you never pay them off, do you? And of course, while you're working to pay them off, you're not going to school. And you're not accruing your own wealth, right? It's going to somebody else. And then I say, you uneducated, poor person. This was your fault. If you had just known the answer to the question, none of this would have happened. Who wants to live in that kind of a world? And yet Dr. King in so many ways demonstrated that we repeat this kind of scenario over and over with our institutions and with our practices. And then we blame those who fall victim to these kinds of systems for their own woes. He, I have to tell you, he only used the word action. But he meant what policymakers mean when they say affirmative action and the internal evidence is overwhelming. He says, you know, here's one of the things that we've got to deal with. We have these systems that have a produced harm, slavery and racial segregation, and we can't just say it's enough to stop enslaving. We have positioned people differently. And I think this is an interesting piece. I love this word. If we do nothing, he says, time becomes the ally of primitive forces. That is, if we do nothing and say, this will work out over time, we actually widen the gap between those who have and those who have less. And that's a very bad thing. And so directly, when this is on the table, King at Drew University says, write your senators, write your congressmen, and urge the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that has the effect of banning race-based discrimination in those areas of private activity, hotels, restaurants, theaters, that are cloaked in a public interest. And for those of you, I see Dr. Shell is here, 
This is where Title IX eventually comes from. The Congress, to defeat this bill, decided if we make it apply to race and gender, although they said sex, this bill will be defeated. One day justice was in session and the bill passed. And of course the last piece of 1960s um, civil rights legislation passed right in the wake of Dr. King's assassination in April 1968 was the Civil Rights Act of 1968 that's often called the Fair Housing Act or the King Act which said you can't use public means to advertise the sale of property and then only sell to people that look like you, right? And so it's an interesting thing. And if you think about the previous slide, one of the things I, I, I learned growing up, why do black people live in these segregated neighborhoods in substandard housing? And I was taught they like it that way. Mm -hmm. you, you learn that in church, right? You learn that in school. And so I found ways to subvert that idea by interfering in, in, in both of those enterprises. And so we conclude that the nefarious result of a system was really an individual choice all along. More of this stuff, right? Affirmative action. What makes, here's some, something for you, if you have 74% of the people in a class that's only 28% of the total population. Is that a proportional or a disproportional outcome? So 74% 70, uh, proportional to the 28? No. And so the idea is when you have this ki these kinds of disparities of data, the state with, uh, as the agent of the people has a duty to remedy these sorts of situations. Problem we struggle with at Adams State University, right? President Savaldi, we're, you know, we, we look and we say, we're gonna do a job search, but of course the only people that are gonna meet our minimum standard are people that were born with so much privilege to begin with, right? And so what do you do to try to correct what is not anything other than the results of centuries of racial oppression and racial apartheid. Now this is a part where King is hard for people, right? We can accept historically his diagnosis of the ills of American society. We can accept some of the legal remedies but King, because he is fundamentally a minister, wants you to become a better person. And the challenge that he sets out is a very hard one. He says, you know, you've got to become a person who embraces the philosophy of nonviolence. If I strike back at you because I'm angry at you, I become just like you. If I hit the violent segregationist, I become like that violent segregationist when I resort to those particular means to affect my liberation. And if you know about the African American struggles for civil rights and civil liberties, this was a hard one for many people in the African American community. And King is often set in juxtaposition with Malcolm X who early on before his trip to Mecca, advocated liberation by any means necessary. And King would say, there's only one means. This is a pretty powerful thing for anyone, and even a minister, to say. If you are not willing to pay the ultimate price for liberty, right? Maybe you're simply unworthy of your own life. That's a powerful thing. 
And it's not like he lives in a world of rose-colored glasses. I love the thing where he says, you know, the command of Jesus of Nazareth in the New Testament is to love your enemies and to bless those who persecute you and, and despitefully use you for my name's sake. And he says, you know, I'm glad he said love. As tough as that, as that is, it's easier than like. And if you look at who he cites here, Right, Strom Thurmond, and what a James O. Eastland from Sunflower County, Mississippi. But uh, here's the piece: why he says this is so important, and why it's such a challenging thing for people. If you're not able to look upon these oppressors as fellow human beings, you yourself imbibe that kind of cancer of hatred that makes you less than what you could be. Burn our homes and threaten our children. We will still love you. I had a wonderful friend who was a psychotherapist. She did the best she could, really. And it, she used to say to me, when I would say, it, I, go, I get so angry when somebody does this. And she would say, why would you give them that power over you? And that's really what King is getting at here. We will not give the perpetrators of violence the power over us so that we repay violence with violence. We simply will refuse. One of my favorite figures in African American history was born Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr., so you will call him Muhammad Ali. And he was the greatest of all time. And I, for those of you that are young, you don't remember the bungle in the jungle in Zaire in 1975. But Ali beat the monstrous prize fighter, George Foreman, and had to do it. What did he call it? The rope-a-dope. This is the moral rope-a-dope. We will not allow you to turn us into who you are. And eventually, by our ability to suffer and to endure, we will exhaust you. And it will be you that are transformed. You'll wind up becoming like us. And wouldn't that be a good thing? I don't know that you can run an organization on principles like this, but it would sure be nice to try. And I sure would like to be in a society like this. And while this is the part of King's philosophy that I think is the most challenging, it's the most theological, it's the most mushy, it's the most otherworldly, and so it's hard for practical humans, maybe this is why we should keep striving after King. Recognize that the problem is national. Let me tell you the most depressing book I know by a scholar named Thomas Segru. He teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. The book is called Sweet Land of Liberty. Yet another book titled from Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And it's called The Forgotten Struggle for Civil Rights in the North. You see, it's easy for me to say, let me tell you how bad Mississippi is. But when you accept that demonstrable reality and then say, where else was much better? And you realize not many places. You can understand how powerful these forces are. The forces that kept African Americans redlined into South Chicago, into Bronzeville for so long. The kinds of race riots in places like Springfield, Missouri, where on the centennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth, a white mob ran all the black people out of town. Maybe this is why my enrollments you know, fluctuate. It's depressing. History can be really depressing. <laughs> but the fact is, the, the racism and slavery, right, were national in the United States. 
you forget that in 1860 there were slaves in New Jersey and you say, oh, wasn't that a free state? Well, take Civil War and Reconstruction and we can work on that one. So it is a national problem. I just love this. I, and I, so I highlighted this thing. I agree with Dr. King. When we get so con conditioned that we become complacent with an immoral status quo, we're not healthy people. And I like this idea, an international association for the advancement of creative maladjustment. <sighs> Great t-shirts, maybe next year, right? Maybe next year for t-shirts. And he says, you know, we need to be like the prophet Amos who said, you know, Israel is not right before God because it, the Jews are not treating one another well. We need to be like Lincoln who said, how can we have a country that's half slave and half free because he was absolutely certain that if it didn't become all free, slavery would be reestablished in places like Illinois and New York. And instead of freedom national, we would have slavery national. And being like Thomas Jefferson, who in the face of centuries of aristocratic privilege would say, no, aristocratic privilege violates natural law. All people are created equal, equal. And so here it is, if you act on this kind of righteous upset, maybe the promise of the American dream could be realized. What King would call the glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. Dr. King is a hard person to follow. And he was not the only person who would be a martyr to civil rights. But he knew whereof he spoke. Sometime you should travel to Montgomery, Alabama and visit the Civil Rights Memorial at the Southern Poverty Law Center. It was designed by Maya Lin, who had designed the Vietnam War Memorial. And it commemorates people who were killed during the Civil Rights Movements. People like the white man William Moore, who simply was walking on the highway to protest injustice and he was killed by uh, Southern whites, to the four girls at 16th Street Church in Birmingham who committed the crime of going to Sunday school early and were murdered by Robert Chambliss. And so, you know, the fact is when we think about King and the civil rights struggle, or when we think about moving forward with civil rights, the price is high because the interest that benefit from racism and injustice have an interest in maintaining their privileged positions and have not been historically above the use of violent means to secure their interests. And so, look, Medgar Evers, they shot him, Byron de la Beckwith shot him in, in Evers' own garage. And his crime that day had been trying to register people to vote. And of course we know in our own day that voting rights are settled, right? We decide we want everybody to vote, right? <sighs> you know, was it Voltaire that gets this one? Uh, le plus se change, le plus même chose. The more things change, the more they remain the same. But maybe this is one of the reasons that Dr. King has such a powerful resonance as a figure, not the only figure, as one of many sacrificing figures in the civil rights movement. That in the end, he was willing to pay the ultimate price. Dr. King had told his advisors, he said, I'll never reach age 40. And they used to joke about this. If you've ever worked in a system like this, you can sort of understand the value of Gallo's humor. He said, you know, now if they start shooting, he would say to Andrew Young, I want you to jump in front and protect me, and I will preach the finest funeral sermon you've ever heard. Andy Young was a fine man, yeah. But of course, on the 4th of April, 1968, the hellhound that had stalked Dr. King for a year caught up with him at the Lorraine Motel, 
So when Dr. King talks about the, the awesome commitment required to be an effective agent of social change, he knew that the ultimate price could be required and of course he would pay the ultimate price. This picture is taken about 10.30 p.m. They've already taken some of the police tape down and this is Dr. King's blood that they're cleaning up. Because we do have to open up for business, right? That was the idea the next day. And so it, to me it's an amazing thing that Dr. King could be associated with an American dream that in his own day was unfulfilled. But one of the amazing things about Dr. King was that what he offered to the United States was not only a prescription to fulfill the dream, but a prescription to fulfill the dream even better than the one that had been envisioned by the Founding Fathers in the 18th century. So that's it. So questions, comments about Dr. King and the American Dream, Dr. King generally. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, I'm struck by the fact that uh, King, well, he was putting together the Poor People's March at that time, and while he had not, and we still have not reached his goals in civil rights, he was moving into opposition to militarism, opposition to uh, the gap between the rich and the poor. Absolutely. Two things that we become more and more militaristic and the gap between the rich and the Has poor grown wider and wider. Hopefully the civil rights, the segregation issue is becoming less and less of a problem. And I think one of the reasons, it's such a good comment. You, you, have something else to? No. Okay. The, 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 the book to read that, that's the easiest book is Harvard Sitkoff, King Been to the Mountaintop, that addresses the incredible movement of Dr. King as he has all of these experiences that he has in an unbelievably brief period as a public figure. Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955. Uh, the assassination, April 4th, 1968. And, and the thing is, is that Dr. King, because he thinks theologically, and so he finds what he called, his phrase is, an acquisitive materialism, right? Where we turn people into things. And you know, this is where he says in 1967, we must move from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. Because aggressive war in Indochina, and poverty in Chicago and Bull Connor in Birmingham were all rooted from his analysis in this moral shortcoming where we turn people into objects and maybe they're poor and they're poor white and we can exploit them or they're black and we can exploit them or they have different eye structures and we can exploit them and so that really becomes a piece about Dr. King and of course poor President Savaldi's had to listen to this now for for years and years and years getting the King holiday right is important because the people who ended up against their w wishes passing the King holiday wanted it to be about voting rights in the South and to be able to say, well, we had this problem and it's been solved. That's what the signing statement of Ronald Reagan in 1983 creating the King holiday actually says. And uh, I meant to say earlier, I think the King Memorial is wonderful, but when I go there, I think about the words that aren't quoted because some would find them objectionable because they are so challenging. Yes, sir. Picking up on what Don said, what you said, and the speech given a year to the day before he died. Right, Riverside. The, the Riverside Church. Um, he made the line that I paraphrase, a nation that year after year spends more money on weapons and war than it does on programs of social uplift is morally... Yeah, he says, approaching moral bankruptcy. And it is a powerful speech. The, uh, the, 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 a couple of things. That, that speech is easy to access. But go to the, the Martin Luther King paper site and read the whole speech. But the yeah, next Joel. day, the New York Times and the Washington mm -hmm. Post said, oh, you've made, everybody has come to like you for all what you've done for civil rights, and now you're a communist for making these statements. Right. And it's an amazing thing. You know, uh, let, let's, 
How do you know King is not a communist? Not only does he say he's not a communist, how do you know he's not a communist? He's, he is a supernatural, supernaturalist in religion, right? So he can't be a materialist. And uh, you, you can read an essay that I wrote on, 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 on this piece, right? But the other side of this, and this is, what, this is what white folks struggle with. They struggle with Jeremiah Wright. They struggle with Barack Hussein Obama. The black church has always been about religion and everything else because it was the only place the African-American community could function, particularly in the South. And black ministers have the role of saving people but also being community leaders and being people who have enough social room to maneuver to champion other kinds of causes like, like economics and, 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 and political matters. And so it was an interesting thing. They said, well, why can't you in effect be like Billy Graham and just have these religious crusades? And it's like, well, you know, Billy Graham's a white guy. And the world for black folk and for black ministers is a different world. Yeah, Joel. When a reporter asked to put down the South to Malcolm X, Malcolm X said, the South, the South is south of Canada. Right. It's a powerful thing. And, you know, when King goes, uh, makes the march from Chicago to Cicero, and he would say, this is worse than anything that he saw in the South. So it is, it is a problem that's, that's national. Yes, Aaron. I, I wonder in your <clears throat> opening slide and the, the quote, from uh, 1964, where he's talking about the, the power of a nonviolent solution. I wonder if he was trying to cut with a double-edged sword at that point, both towards the dominant white institution and towards Malcolm X, who you mentioned in your talk. Was, it, was he... Was he addressing both of those issues at the same time? I, can't, I, I don't know because he doesn't tell us. But this is what I would say is that one of the best stories that I know about Dr. King takes place in Chicago where among young African Americans, separatism, black power philosophy has taken root. And King's handlers are going, where is Martin? We can't find him. And they're afraid because he is in a neighborhood where being black might not protect him from black on black violence. And they find him in a semi-destroyed building, in effect, having a give and take. And it was a give and take. It, it originally was like described as a seminar, but it's clear that angry black people are telling Martin, you do not understand. And he is trying to say that nonviolent philosophy is relevant in Alabama and it's relevant in Chicago and it's relevant to people who were born in 1929 and it was relevant given the time to people born in 1950. But ultimately Malcolm X comes back. I mean, he, he loses that battle, right? Right. But is triumphant in the war because Malcolm X ends up apologizing for his... Well, and you know, Mal Malcolm himself, the, 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 the Malcolm's trip to Mecca was a life-changing event because in the same way that, that King's largely Christian God was the God of Jew and Gentile and white and black and female and male, Malcolm's God was the God of all those same people. And so how could you be a devout Muslim and hate those people that God had created? Yeah, so it's a powerful, powerful idea. Yes, Megan. What do you say towards people that criticize King for not, um, like, literally sitting on the bus for the uh, bus boycotts and then doing the speech at the end instead of being there and supporting with the rest of it? Yeah, and I think uh, it's a good question. And the most famous example is when the Freedom Riders come to Atlanta and they say, Dr. King, go with us. And he won't, he won't go. And uh, I don't know what you do with that. Uh, you know, there, there are people that say, I don't understand why Lincoln didn't issue an executive order and just free the slaves. Well, that one's easier because I know the, the, the legal and constitutional answer to that question. Uh, was King afraid? Maybe. Uh, I certainly would have been. And, you know, the other side of the question, so what if King had died in 1955 or 1961? Would it have been better? And, and, and I don't know. And, and this is the piece about King. This is not a perfect man. 
He is a flesh and blood man who, to quote Sitkoff, he should have been a better husband and he should have been a better father. And now you can go and see what Sitkoff means, right, about this. He, he would often in his talks talk about his own shortcomings. And I remember when Clayton Carson, who is the director of the King Papers Project at Stanford, had to break the news that King plagiarized his doctoral dissertation, although I can tell you that not one professor read it. I'm certain of that. The, the evidence is clear. They simply didn't read it. Or, and, and so uh, the Boston University owns this. But, but Carson's point was, but Carson's point was, you know, the best thing about King, when you think about him as uh, an example, as a prophet, as an encourager for social justice and social change, was precisely that he wasn't perfect. That is, if an imperfect, flawed, young black man like Martin Luther King could accomplish this much, then all of us can accomplish something. And so, uh, you know, Thank you, Clayton Carson. Make sure he gets credit for that. I never would have had uh, that, that, that kind of an insight, but I think it's, it's a way of thinking about Dr. King that's important. One of the things Dr. Uh, Payne is going to talk about tomorrow is the sort of demythologizing of Dr. King. Uh, because it's much easier to make him a marble figure and honor him in the abstract than to take anything he said seriously. Right? So, um, just, an, just an idea. Other questions, comments? Uh, yes, sir. I just request that everyone consider attending the one-man show that's going to premiere. This is a world premiere, Ghost in the House, uh, with uh, actor Ernie Hudson. This is a professional actor, 40 years in the business. Uh, we're getting this at literally a fraction of the cost this will that this will cost in, in Los Angeles. And that's February 2nd, 2? Two o'clock at 7.30. 2 at 7.30. Cost is minimal, $5 for students, $10 for community. And uh, we really want to have a good turnout because uh, they're coming all the way from Burbank to do this. Yeah. And I would hate to have an empty house for them. So, yeah. But it is the history of the first African-American it, black. It's Jack, the Jack day. Johnson story. Yeah. You saw the old 1970 movie with James Earl Jones, um, yeah. Great White Hope, it's uh, partially based on that. Yeah. So I, I, I think, and he's just an amazing guy. We, we Students did an interview with him. And, uh, he could very well be one of our students in terms of his background and what he went through as a kid. So yeah. I hope you'll all uh, try very hard to make that. There, there is a talk back yes. after the 2 o'clock performance on Saturday. Also, tickets are on sale now, and there's more information on the AC website. Yeah, so, so real loud, Julie, just Which? <clears throat> time and date, place. Saturday, February Sa 2nd, 2 o'clock. Saturday, February 2nd, 2 o'clock, and at 7. 7.30. 7.30, okay. Theater. All right. Ghost in the House World Premiere. Ghost in the House World Premiere. It's a great thing. Yes, Megan. So just as a reminder, we have Charles Green tomorrow. Um, then Thursday we have a bias luncheon as well as um, a stereotype activity in the sub. Um, and then we have the basketball game uh, Friday as long as we still have an ammo case. Wear, wear your shirt. We have shirts for some sale at the table for $4, so please pick up one. And support And one of the things, buy shirts. The, 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 the intention is... Uh, to use some of this to begin a process to establish some, some scholarship. So this is more than helping out a club as noble as that is. This is helping out somebody having a chance to come to Adams State University and maybe become the next Dr. King. So buy a shirt, make a donation. So, it's a yeah. different red than the Western Yeah, state. this is not Western State red. This is a much brighter, brighter red. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out.